I worked as a park ranger here in Oregon and used to patrol a particular trail that was popular with nearby college students. The campus was only about a 20 or 30 minute walk from this trail, which was relatively short and wound its way into the eastern part of the park. On weekends, the trail was often filled with groups of students enjoying a bit of outdoor activity. Sometimes, however, you'd find a few students misbehaving, either drinking or causing a nuisance, but for the most part, they were polite and well-behaved hikers. There was one time in particular when the trail was almost always empty. Saturday mornings. Even the most dedicated students often spent their Friday nights partying, so the trail was usually deserted. On the rare occasion you did spot someone, it was usually an older hiker or perhaps a couple, but never college-aged kids. One early Saturday morning, I spotted someone ahead of me on the trail who looked like a college student, which immediately caught my attention. How do you recognize a college student, you might ask? First-time hikers are usually easy to spot ill-prepared, wearing the wrong gear. This girl had no backpack and was wearing something more suited to a night out than a morning hike. She was moving slowly, the kind of pace that says, this seemed like a good idea at first, but now I'm regretting it, which is common among inexperienced hikers who take on more than they can handle. She was walking so slowly that I started to wonder if she was still hung over from the night before. Every so often, she'd stumble or sway a little, which made me worry. As I got closer, I noticed her clothes were dirty, as if she had fallen or laid down in the dirt. She was also drenched in sweat, with wet hair clinging to her face and a dark patch of dampness on her back and shoulders. It was clear that something was seriously wrong with her, though I had no idea just how bad it was. When I was about 10 or 15 feet behind her, she still hadn't noticed me. I didn't want to startle her, so I greeted her with a simple, good morning. When she turned around, I almost jumped in shock. She had a severe wound above one of her eyes, and the eye itself was caked in blood. I doubted she could see out of it at all. Someone had clearly tried to seriously hurt her, yet somehow she was still walking. As soon as she saw me, she collapsed to the ground, sitting down with a thud. She reached out toward me, mumbling, water, water, over and over again. I quickly gave her some water and radioed headquarters for medical help. While I was calling for help, I noticed an unmistakable smell, a strong chemical smell. That's when it hit me. This girl hadn't just been through an accident. Someone had poured gasoline on her. I kept asking her what happened, but she couldn't seem to speak coherently. She just kept gulping down water, staring off into the distance, as if in shock. The only clear thing she managed to say before passing out was, my friends. It terrified me to think there might be more people in danger out there. I feared she might not make it, but thankfully, she still had a pulse when one of my coworkers arrived with an ATV and a stretcher. As far as I know, she was still alive when the EMTs took her to the hospital. My team spent the rest of the day searching the area around the trail for any signs of her friends. All we found was a burned out campfire with a few empty beer bottles and liquor cans scattered around it. But the ranger who found it mentioned that the place reeked of gasoline. It wasn't until a week or so later that we learned what really happened. The girl's haunting last words, my friends, took on a new, chilling meaning. She hadn't said it out of concern for them. She was asking why the very people she trusted had done such a horrific thing to her. Her own friends had lured her into the woods, beaten her nearly to death, and tried to set her on fire. Apparently, the only thing that saved her from being burned alive was that their lighter wasn't working. They then tried lighting a stick using the campfire, but by the time they managed to get it lit, the girl had regained enough strength to escape into the woods and hide. She stayed hidden for hours, drifting in and out of consciousness, before finally summoning the strength to walk towards safety. And that's when I found her. The reason behind the attack? A stupid love triangle. The ringleader had a crush on a guy who liked the victim, and jealousy had spiraled into violence. Fueled by alcohol, 
the group had conspired to kill one of their own over petty jealousy. That's the most terrifying thing to me, that people are capable of such senseless violence over something so trivial. All of them were arrested and kicked out of college, and most received long prison sentences after a highly publicized trial. For weeks, my team was glued to the radio, desperate for any updates. We eventually learned the full extent of what had happened to the girl, and it still sends chills down my spine. That experience was one of the most horrifying of my career. The woods can be dangerous, but animals kill out of survival. People, on the other hand, sometimes kill for no reason at all. For the past few years, I've been working as a park ranger for the UK's Heritage Trust. The trust has been around for more than a century and is the biggest organization in the UK dedicated to preserving places of historical and natural significance. This includes everything from ancient estates to national parks. Since I grew up in County Armagh, Northern Ireland, I eventually ended up stationed in the Mourne Mountains. The mountains include a few forests and parks under the care of the Heritage Trust, such as Silent Valley, Tullamore, and Rostrover. These places are all within an area of about 80 kilometers, so they're managed by the team I'm a part of. Although I've been an official ranger for around four years, I also trained in the Mourne area, and having grown up just north in Banbridge, I knew the region extremely well. By the time I got promoted, my knowledge of the local landscape meant that other team members would often come to me for advice on terrain and directions. That's how I found myself receiving an early morning phone call from a colleague, asking for help. She had gotten a call from a camper who'd woken up to find some dead sheep near his tent. She described it as a couple of sheep. Since sheep often die for various reasons, I wasn't particularly concerned. My colleague asked for my help as I had a better chance of finding where the camper was. Though I was happy to help, I was puzzled as to why the camper couldn't just lead her back to his camp. She said it wasn't that he couldn't, but that he wouldn't. She mentioned he seemed genuinely frightened. This caught my attention because, although waking up to dead sheep isn't pleasant, it didn't seem like something that would terrify someone to the point of avoiding their own campsite. From my colleague's vague directions, I was able to narrow down the general area where the man might have camped. He was wild camping, not in a designated spot, so locating him wasn't easy. As I was searching, I called my colleague again, who still had the camper with her at the Mourne Country Park office. I asked her to get as much information from him as possible. He explained that after seeing the disturbing scene, he'd run all the way to the park office. He hadn't grabbed any of his belongings before fleeing. I asked why he didn't just call for help from the campsite, and he explained that fear had overwhelmed him. As I was driving, I started to wonder just how many sheep it would take to scare someone who sounded much older than me. I asked my colleague to clarify how many sheep were involved. The camper couldn't give a specific number, only that it was a mess and he suggested I take some kind of weapon with me if I was going to investigate. While park rangers in the UK don't carry firearms, his warning seemed overly dramatic to me. I eventually got on the phone with the camper myself, and he tried his best to describe the location. He mentioned that on his first day, he passed a body of water shaped like a sea. The only body of water in the area with that shape is Spelga Dam, and he mentioned he camped about a 10-minute walk from it. This significantly narrowed my search area. I drove to a couple of potential spots and, after some time, spotted a bright red tent among some trees. As I approached, I saw the campsite, but from a distance, there were no dead sheep in sight. After crossing a field and hopping a fence, I got my first clear view of the area, and it was disturbing. The reason the camper couldn't estimate how many sheep there were became clear. There were bits of wool, flesh, and bones scattered everywhere. It was one of the most unsettling things I've ever seen. I counted the remains of four sheep based on their skulls and other pieces scattered around. 
I called another colleague to secure the site while I headed over to the park office to talk with the camper in person. When I arrived, the man was still visibly shaken, sitting in a small office with my colleague, who had been offering him cups of tea to calm him down. I asked the camper if he was a heavy sleeper, as I couldn't understand how he hadn't woken up during the night. He didn't have a clear answer, only suggesting that someone might have left the remains there as a warning. When I asked if he'd had any conflicts with anyone, he said no. After our conversation, my next task was to track down the farmer whose sheep had gone missing. We quickly found him, and when I arrived at his farm, he told me that four sheep had gone missing over the past two weeks, disappearing one at a time. The farmer was eager for me to inspect his fences, which he had fortified to prevent such escapes. He suspected that someone had been stealing his sheep. The situation took a turn for the strange when all four missing sheep turned up dead and mutilated at the same campsite. It was clear something unusual was going on, but we never got to the bottom of it. Wildlife experts examined the remains but couldn't determine if the sheep had been killed by an animal or a person. The police weren't particularly interested in investigating the matter further. In the end, the event was chalked up to foxes or stray dogs, although those of us who saw the scene firsthand knew it was more than that. The case remains unresolved, and it's something that still gives me chills when I think about it, even years later. It's not what I know that haunts me. It's the unanswered questions that linger. I work as a forest ranger in my home country, which is now called Czechia. I'm writing to share something unusual happening in one particular region of my country. Here's some background. Czechia is located in Central Europe, and the largest mountain range here is the Carpathians. A smaller range named Trebek is part of the Carpathians. These mountains are not very tall, triangular in shape, and located on the western side of the country. Unlike some of the more treacherous ranges here, such as the Tatra Mountains, where rock falls, bad weather, and wild animals can make it dangerous, Trebek doesn't have these same natural dangers. The climate is moderate, and there are no extreme weather events like earthquakes or tornadoes. It seems like an ordinary, peaceful place, but that's far from the truth. For some, the Trebek area is considered dangerous. A number of people have gone missing here, and their bodies have never been found. I think many of these cases can be attributed to tragic accidents. Wild animals possibly attacked the individuals, making it difficult to locate their remains. But there are other cases that can't be easily explained. The disappearances in Trebek have become somewhat of an urban legend here, similar to the stories about the Bermuda Triangle. While the disappearances are real, people seem to brush them off, as the strange cases occur far enough apart that no one feels too alarmed. It's often met with a shrug and the thought, at least it wasn't me. I've compiled a list of some of these cases, and I'd like to hear your opinion because something truly unsettling seems to be happening. The first case dates back to 1927, when a man named Adam Samusil vanished during a snowy day in November. He had simply told a neighbor he was going out for a walk and never returned. Heavy snow made it impossible to search for him properly until the snow melted in spring, but by that time, he was long gone. No trace of him was ever found. Some speculated that Adam may have taken his own life, as he led a lonely existence without a family, but all agreed that it was odd that no remains were discovered, especially since Trebek is relatively small. The next case occurred in 1938 when a man named Victor Fisher disappeared. Victor worked at a shoe factory in a small town called Branson, which lies west of the Trebek Mountains. He worked six days a week and would visit his family on Sundays, as they still lived in the countryside, unable to afford to live in the city with him. However, in January of 1938, he chose not to visit his family, instead deciding to hike through the woods near Trebek. According to a co-worker, Victor had mentioned his intention to visit a place called Sirni Rad, which translates to Black Castle in Czech. 
this is an ancient, ruined fortress that was once used to fend off raiders many centuries ago. While it's occasionally visited by tourists, it seemed odd that Victor would choose this as a hiking destination. The Black Castle is about 20 miles from Branson, meaning he would have needed to walk 40 miles round trip to get back to his residence in time for work the next day. It didn't seem like something a hardworking man would choose to do on his day off. Victor's wife reported him missing after some time, and for months he remained unaccounted for. Then, in May of that year, something unexpected happened. Victor was found alive. No one knew what had happened to him or where he had been. He was discovered in a field over 20 miles from Branson, on the opposite side of the Trebek Mountains. His clothes were torn to shreds, he was unconscious, and reports mentioned that he had severe injuries. Some accounts described them as burns, while others said they were cuts. He was taken to a hospital and remained there for an extended period. When Victor regained consciousness, he had no recollection of what had happened to him during the time he was missing. Whatever he had gone through, it had a profound impact on him. He was so traumatized that he spent the rest of his life in a mental hospital. There are many theories about what happened to Victor. Some say that tensions leading up to World War II resulted in him being falsely accused of espionage, explaining his injuries and why he wasn't killed. Others speculate about far more outlandish possibilities, such as time travel, alternate dimensions, or even alien abductions. While I don't subscribe to those ideas, the lack of any concrete answers has led to some wild speculation. Personally, I don't know what happened to Victor, but it was clearly something terrifying. Another bizarre disappearance took place in 1964. A couple named John and Elena decided to take a trip to the city of Lanek in February. They parked their car near the edge of a forest and set off on a hike in the Trebek Mountains. The car was left untouched, and no one noticed anything unusual about their behavior prior to the trip. Yet, just like the others, John and Elena vanished into the forest and were never seen again. Their case garnered significant attention, with news outlets covering it extensively, and a nationwide search was conducted. Despite all efforts, the couple was never found. According to a policeman who worked on the case, it was as if they had simply walked into the woods and disappeared without a trace. There have been many other cases of missing people in Trebek, but most of the time, they are eventually found with an injury or having gotten lost, completely normal explanations. However, these few cases of complete disappearance, along with Victor's sudden reappearance with no memory and strange wounds, leave even rational people like me questioning the boundaries of reality and science fiction. What frustrates me the most is that very few people outside of Czechia know about the Trebek disappearances, and those who do often dismiss them as folklore. Here in Czechia, people tend to shrug it off, as if it's just another odd story. I'm convinced there is a logical explanation for what's happening, but I can't figure out what it is. That's why I'm trying to spread awareness, hoping that more attention might finally lead to some answers. Several years ago, I worked for the park services in Alaska. One day, we received a call about some illegal dumping on a local trail. So another employee and I went out to investigate. The area was pretty remote with only a few joggers around. As we walked along, my coworker suddenly pointed into the woods and said, what the heck? There's a guy over there. About 20 yards away, there was a man, a white guy with medium length hair, crouched behind some bushes, just watching us. When he realized we had spotted him, he stood up and stretched his arms out, like he was just enjoying the day. He came toward us, and it turned out my coworker actually recognized him. The man was a local builder who had worked on a deck for my friend the previous year. After exchanging greetings, the guy explained that he had just stepped off the trail to use the bathroom which was odd because that clearly wasn't what he had been doing when we saw him. Still, he didn't seem too suspicious, and since my friend knew him, we didn't think much of it. 
We made sure he wasn't doing anything illegal, then continued on our way, and he walked with us for a bit before going off on his own. A few years later, I heard the same man had been arrested. At first, I thought it had something to do with an argument or robbery at a coffee shop, but the truth was far stranger. The man, Israel Keyes, turned out to be a serial killer. He had kidnapped, tortured, and killed a woman after that supposed coffee shop incident. What made it even more disturbing was how he had been traveling across the country for years, randomly murdering people. He would bury kill kits filled with weapons, cash and supplies, and return years later to use them. After his arrest, I went back to the spot where we had seen him to see if there was anything hidden there, but I didn't find anything. Some people speculated he might have been waiting to ambush someone on the trail that day, but that didn't seem like his usual method, from what I understood. To this day, I can't fully explain our encounter. Since Keyes took his own life before his trial, I'll probably never know for sure what was really going on that day. As unusual as it may sound, my first job after graduating was as a trainee ranger with the National Park Service, stationed in Northern California. Our job involved using ATVs after dark to follow a survey protocol that included making owl hoots and listening for responses. One evening, while riding my ATV along a logging road by a river, I spotted a blur off to the side. Suddenly, a small black bear appeared running just a few feet in front of my ATV. I quickly slowed down to avoid hitting it, but given its size, I was worried that its mother might be nearby, potentially leading to a dangerous encounter. The bear ran ahead of me for what felt like ages, but was likely only about five seconds before vanishing into the woods. Once the road was clear, I sped up on the ATV and left the area quickly. Looking back, the bear was probably a yearling and no longer with its mother. However, at the moment, the thought of a mother bear being close was quite frightening. I work as a park ranger in New Mexico, and a few years ago, we were battling a particularly severe wildfire outbreak. We were collaborating with a team of wildland firefighters, coordinating and supplying the various crews in our relentless, sleepless effort to control the fires. On our incident maps, we often mark sensitive areas, including locations with endangered species, known marijuana farms, and Native American lands with cultural significance. I can't even remember which day it was, as assignments can stretch from 14 to 28 days depending on the need for resources. We were working with a Native American crew because our division was in culturally important land. Everything was going smoothly until nightfall, and it was almost time for a break. We were all exhausted, inhaling smoke all day with little rest, which was typical. The fire was mostly under control in our area, except for a few hot spots that needed attention. While I was resting against a tree, our usual radio chatter suddenly turned into static, which is common in such remote areas. I had one of those startling moments, like waking up from a dream where you're falling. I saw figures moving behind trees, almost like ghostly shapes, and then disappearing. No one else reported seeing these figures, but I've heard similar stories before. Although I'm not inclined to believe in ghosts or paranormal phenomena, I have to admit that what I saw felt real. I prefer to think it was just a hallucination from exhaustion. Been working as a park ranger for a little under a decade, and this is the most terrifying experience I've had. On a typical patrol day, while driving along a dirt road, I noticed a thick plume of smoke ahead. I figured I might need to report a fire, but when I turned the corner, I saw a van parked right in the middle of the road, fully engulfed in flames. 
the tires were melting and the van was bursting with fire. At first, I assumed someone had abandoned the van and set it on fire, so I didn't think too much of it. I called emergency services and had to take a longer route to bypass the scene. Later, I learned that the van wasn't abandoned. Someone had been in the driver's seat and was likely deceased by the time I arrived. While I don't regret not investigating further, it was clear this wasn't an accident. The van was stationary in the road without having collided with anything. It turned out the driver had taken his own life. I can't fathom why someone would choose such a method. The location was odd, not remote or near his home. I often think about it because it seems so inexplicable, aside from some severe engine malfunction.